Don, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, maybe to kick things off, um, you know, tell us a little about yourself, like how you got into tech, um, how you, um, you know, made it out to, to California originally. Uh, a little bit of background on Don would be, would be great. Sure. So I originally uh, grew up in the East Coast, uh, Boston, greater Boston area. Started uh, day trading and becoming interested in finance and investing at a very young age. And so the real story behind ARC doesn't start with tech, but more so on the, the finance side, the, the, the fin part of the, the fintech play. Um, so started uh, becoming really passionate about uh, the financial services and capital markets in my early teens. And then went on to study finance in undergrad. And after graduating from uh from undergrad, I moved to New York and uh, and, and followed the traditional uh, finance track with uh, the intent of of climbing up the ranks in uh, in, uh, in private equity and the hedge fund world. Uh, until I decided I wanted to uh, to move to the West Coast to go to Stanford for business school, and so the real start of the entrepreneurial experience uh, came alongside the move uh, from the East Coast, uh, where I was very much on that finance, the pure play finance track. And then, uh, and then finally moving out to the West Coast uh, just uh, five, five or six years ago, where I was introduced to uh, the entrepreneurial environment that is uh, Silicon Valley and, and Palo Alto uh, more specifically. So it was that change uh, that uh, where I woke up for the first time, right? I, I got my first exposure to, uh, to, to software and, and entrepreneurship and technology more broadly, and, and the passion really took off. And so... By the end of my second year at Stanford Business School, uh, I had these competing passions, you know, dual uh, dual interests or competing interests in finance, traditional finance investing and and uh, in technology and software. Um, and I found an opportunity to merge the two with ARC. And that brings us through uh, present day. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that Steph and I talk about is like, you know, why folks decide to go down the kind of entrepreneurial journey. Um, and so sometimes, you know, they're kind of around, you know, Silicon Valley, I think helps a lot with that. Uh, but in other cases, you know, they're, they're from areas where maybe that, that entrepreneurial bug is not as strong or they're in an industry where, you know, to some extent, or maybe even a large extent, like going that route is looked down upon or less certain or whatever. Um, as Steph came from investment banking, you know, you come from a bit of a, of a finance background yourself. Um, I think when we first met, you you had, I think, done, or like at least when we first started talking a little bit more, you had done your internship at a, an extremely large like private equity firm. So just curious, like given all that, like how did you kind of like break free when you were having conversations even with with friends who were in the finance world? Like what did they think of, you know, your move and doing this when you were foregoing like a lot of, you know, kind of certain salary? Yeah, it's it was a really challenging decision at the time in hindsight the benefit of hindsight it's it's a no brainer i haven't looked back getting there was the hard part break breaking the the golden handcuffs of the traditional finance track that's something i talk to a lot of uh aspiring entrepreneurs from traditional financial services uh what i talk to them about on a regular basis uh folks from new york who, who work in investment banking or or uh, private equity or, or other investing roles they ask me all the time about switching you know how do you leave how do you how do you give up uh, give up give up that that finance a path that you work so hard to get to, um, and in my case uh, it was fortuitous. I mean, I when when you're living in that bubble on the East Coast in New York, uh, working in, at a late stage private equity fund or working at a at a bulge bracket investment bank, uh, it's hard to leave. You become um, uh, you become part of that bubble and that ecosystem. Ironically, it's the exact same thing on the West Coast. Uh, what what is what is cool in in uh, in New York? You know, the the, op, the inverse is true in in San Francisco, right? So, uh, in, in when you're living in Manhattan and following that very cookie cutter linear path to high finance, you know, everyone aspires to work for the the big private equity funds and and the Tiger Cubs. Uh, you go to you go to the West Coast and you live in Palo Alto and and no, you know, no one wants to do that. Everyone wants to start their own company or work for a big tech company or, or the hottest uh, new AI tech startup. And uh, that paradigm shift, I, you know, I experienced that firsthand. I went to Stanford thinking that, you know, people would, would admire my finance background. It's not the case. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not what folks want to do. And, and you quickly learn why. Uh, you meet lots of entrepreneurs, uh, founders and tech operators 
on campus and, and around the greater you know, Bay Area, even outside of Stanford. And you quickly realize that there is more uh, to life uh, than, than spreadsheet modeling and, and investing in, in late stage, uh, late stage companies. Uh, so for me, it was it was lucky, right? I got a couple of years. I was fortunate to have a couple of years to pull my head out of the sand and see what else was out there, right? Just enough time to to get out of that bubble. And to your point, Lior, uh, through my second into my second year at Stanford, I still thought I was going back. I, I'd signed a job offer to join the largest private equity fund in the one of the largest private equity funds in the world, uh, and my intent was to go there after graduation. Uh, but it freed up a lot of my time. To find something better, what what would motivate me more than that that track that <clears throat> that career path that I aspired towards my entire life, and and for me that was entrepreneurship, uh, and in building a tech company of my own. That resonates so much because I feel like um, one of the biggest things that prevented me from doing founder stuff earlier was the golden handcuffs thing. Um, but then going to Stanford and particularly making no money for two years it was so much easier to make like a little bit more than that than going from like a full salary to much lower than that. So, you know, psychologically it freed up my, <laughs> freed up my mind, even yeah. though, uh, rationally it makes no sense. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You, you, you pull out of that, that world, that bubble, uh, for, uh, for me, it took over a year, uh, but you're out of that bubble for, uh, probably my case, 15, 16 months. And that's the time that's required to reset and recalibrate and, and do some soul searching around, you know, what you really care about, what are you passionate about? Um, where do you see yourself? Not, not in a year, uh, not in three years, but, but over the long term. And, um, and entrepreneurship is fulfilling in ways that finance never could be uh, for me. I found an opportunity to combine both interests by taking that finance skill set and applying it to an entrepreneurial uh, tech environment. And ultimately, that was the, the sweet spot um, and why I haven't looked back since. You know, speaking of, of finding oneself, um, a fun fact about our relationship is we meet, you know, more officially in Touchy Feely, the famous Stanford class where, you know, you learn about feelings and, and all sorts of different things. Um, I have a hot take maybe about the class for, for Stanford graduates in a second, but just curious, <laughs> uh, what did you learn? What did you learn from that class about finding yourself? And did that even help you along your journey as you were thinking about, you know, you know starting ARC as well? Yeah. Uh... That class, I mean, look, I got a couple of really great things out of that class. Meeting you, Lior, was one of them. Uh, uh, that That's where- the, Oh my you know, gosh, don't flatter him. I that's the that. one rule on this podcast right. is that you guys are already too big. So yeah. we don't do that here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll then so, you $10 later. I appreciate it. There, there, was, there was probably some introspection that occurred during that class. I think the bigger takeaway from that from that one and, and really any class- uh, that I, I got value out of, you know, from the classroom environment was the ability to manage people, empathize with people from different backgrounds. Um, in my currency, managing a, a large and growing team, uh, it's important to be able to see uh, see things from someone else's vantage point, from their perspective. If a deliverable isn't uh, completed on time, if, if someone is underperforming, or even quite frankly, if someone's outperforming, uh, how to approach those conversations and see things from their vantage point, understand what they want out of this role, what motivates them. Uh, those softer skills uh, uh, I was able to refine uh, in some of the classes uh, at Stanford, including uh, a touchy feely with uh, with Lior. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I definitely. Take? My hot take. Yeah, let's get a hot take now. Let's get a hot take going. Um, So look, I think most of the time at business school, any classes you take, you're not going to learn very much. And so compared to that, I actually think I learned a lot in touchy-feely. But I also think, and while I kind of echo your sentiments about some of the things you learned, we were also spending like, you know, hours and hours and hours on end. And there's also, there's just a lot of unrealistic situations in, in handling individuals that if they went to you know, Stanford business school, or they went to other business schools, they're, they're probably going to be receptive to that way of handling situation In other situations in startups, when you're moving quickly, like, you know, maybe you should, you know, you can make the argument, you know, speak with in in the kind of touchy feely way, but in in many, in many cases, like those situations are not applicable. Uh, Additionally, if you're not in like a coastal area, uh, like, or you're working with folks that aren't from San Francisco or New York, I think many times, like some of those lessons aren't as applicable. Like if I tried to use some of the touchy feely stuff with my, you know, folks in Texas and friends in Texas, they probably tell tell me to go fuck myself, uh, respectfully. (laughs) Uh, But at the same time, like you learn a lot. So anyway, like compared to like what, you know, you learn in, in the rest of your class, actually, I think you learn a lot. 
But then there's like so many lessons that I think aren't as transferable as one might think, unless you're just only in San Francisco. I think uh, I probably would have approached my coursework a little bit differently had I mm-hmm. known out of the, the at the outset what I'd be doing after graduation. Right, I yeah. went in as you pointed out with the intent of going back into private equity, yeah. and I loaded up on all the top finance and investing courses, yeah. and you know, TA'd all the all the top finance classes. Um, by my second year, uh, I was scrambling to find you know coding and entrepreneurship classes, and I spent yeah. most of my uh, free time and most of my my the time I was supposed to be in class building Arc, finding right. finding co founders, raising capital, right? And so yeah. everything switched. If I go back and do it over again, uh, and, and especially if I knew it was going to be a remote environment the full time, yeah. I would have loaded up on on uh, on entrepreneurship classes and uh, and computer science coursework. Um, I think that could have been uh, really valuable for me, and that's something that you know uh, Stanford and a few other programs uniquely offer to their MBA students. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, in, ter- in terms of the ideation process, um, I know, you know, uh, you, you, Nick, were, were kind of working through different ideas. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that process because we get a lot of questions from folks. It's like, how do I even begin? Like, what, what, what are things that I don't even know that I don't know about the ideation process? Like, curious how y'all approached it. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we went in. So Nick and I were working on very different ideas independently before uh, joining forces. Nick was working on a, a B2B, a, a vertical labor marketplace uh, for the industrial sector. So helping place companies with, uh, with factory workers. Uh, I was working uh, with uh, several Stanford, uh, Stanford alum in the, the prop tech space who wanted to spin up uh, a, a ghost kitchen software business. And, and I was deep with them modeling out the operating, uh, the operating plan uh, for that business, uh, when uh, Nick and I decided that we would team up and find something together that fit our mutual interests in in finance, and combine that with the the growing interest in entrepreneurship and software, and so we started out uh, knowing that we wanted to work together and having both uh, tinkered on our own you know projects independently on campus. Um, and uh, what we were solving for out of the gate was first, first and foremost, founder market fit. So what market do we know the best? Ghost Kitchens was not it for me. Well, my first job, you know, my first handful of jobs as a kid was, was working in, in kitchens as a, as a fry cook and, you know, cleaning dishes and mopping floors. That's not where my core competency lies. Uh, it's, it's, it's financial services and cap markets. Uh, and same goes with with Nick. It wasn't necessarily building vertical marketplaces. It was understanding uh, capital markets and and fundraising and access to capital for companies and making fundamental uh, credit and equity underwriting decisions. And so uh, we started out knowing we wanted to work uh, in fintech and that we wanted to work together. And checking those two boxes is is you know, the, mo- the most important. Finding the right founder that will stick with you through the good times and the bad. I mean, that, that you're not, you're nine tenths the way there. Uh, having founder market fit, uh, particularly if it's an infinitely large market that's underpenetrated by technology, like financial services, well, uh, that's, that's gravy. And so <clears throat> we started out by, uh, I, by ideating uh, across the full, uh, the whole, the full FinTech uh, landscape outside in. We worked on uh, regulatory crowdfunding was our first real play where we thought we could overcome what we called the, the negative selection bias and traditional uh, reg CF. Uh, so, so giving private market investment opportunities uh, to, to high net worth individuals that we could overcome the adverse selection in that space uh, for private market investment opportunities through software and, uh, and through community. And so it's kind of like a, a, a book face meets we funder concept. That was our first big idea. We met with dozens of investors. We applied to Y Combinator. Uh, we we pitched a bunch of VCs. We got a, we got a whole bunch of rejections. But it, it got our minds moving in the direction towards access to capital, broadening access to capital for companies, uh, providing broader access to to investors. And that's ultimately how you know through a, a number of subsequent pivots and deviations and in customer interviews. That's how we ultimately landed on on the alternative financing space, but purely B2B. 
uh, and specifically with revenue-based financing to get started. I have a, I have a confession. I feel like I knew of you, like you and Nick separately before you guys even knew who I was because every (laughs) time I would work on an idea, someone from my class or your class would be like, Oh, you know, like Nick from, you know, the class below is like, we're working on something very similar or like, Oh, Don's working on something. I'm like, Jesus, why is like every pivot that I'm going into also being worked on by these guys? Yeah. Now it makes sense because we come from a similar finance background, I guess, but I thought that was amusing. So anyway, I'm glad we're not competing anymore. I would hate to compete against you guys, but uh, yeah, it worked out in the I'm end. Sure, I'm sure you would have been a formidable competitor. Uh, we look, we, the, the headline is uh, we started with each other. We knew it was FinTech uh, and then it was a whole bunch of of market discovery, talking to as many uh, customers, pe- people that we thought could become customers at one point, getting their feedback and rapidly iterating uh, the the, pro- the product um, verbally before investing anything in, in, in R&D. And so when we finally, you know, we, when we saw our first signs of product market fit in this alternative financing space, that's when we doubled down. We brought in technical talent and we started building of building the, the the product and talking to uh, to investors and customers around formalizing the relationship. You know, one dynamic that I'm not sure if you kind of thought about this. What if, and, and maybe it's it's you know not worth the exercise, but just curious. Like, so you you start with this revenue based financing product, and eventually you, you you learn and you you know pivot into what Arc has started to become, and, and then you kind of continue to iterate on on that, on that kind of core premise. Um, curious if you've kind of thought about like if you had gone like out to originally fundraise with what ARC is now, do you think you would have been able to, given the fact that you're now in a really competitive space and you've carved out, you've carved out this really interesting surface area for yourself, but I imagine that pitch a couple of years ago would have been like quite difficult to overcome. So I don't know if you've kind of thought about that, what if, or how you kind of thought about the process of going from where ARC was to where ARC is, but just, you know, curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, that is an excellent question. Uh, and extraordinarily relevant to my my go-to-market and fundraising strategy. Uh, and it actually relates back to your prior question. Once I honed in on this alternative financing space, uh, I started to explore adjacencies. I knew that uh, direct lending was not going to be the end state of, of the business that I wanted to build. Uh, but as a non-technical first-time founder and CEO, what I wanted was an execution-driven uh, monetization opportunity uh, very early on. So, so find a market, a product that I could I could spin up quickly with limited R and D, uh, where the real product was a financial product. Yeah. Um, the real product was the underwriting model that I built in Excel, and the customer that that I that I the customers that I sold uh, this bespoke credit product to, identifying the sweet spot ICP raising the capital, creating the underwriting model in Excel, uh, and, and really doing everything manually uh, and through and through uh, through direct selling and in relationships. So, but I knew that wasn't the end state. At the sure. end of the day, I wanted to build yeah. a software company, but I needed the execution to unlock the capital to invest the R&D in building out the software platform. And so my three-part plan, it's actually the same as the pre-seed pitch deck. Once I landed on this alternative financing wedge as a starting point, I knew it would be exactly that. Start out with direct lending, uh, then raise more capital and build, invest in the software. I went from having you know zero engineers to today it's north of fifty percent of our of our fifty person team. Uh, it's it's that engineering talent, the ability to attract the right talent. We can build a best in class software product and create that that end state vision, that platform value. So phase one, direct lending, that's the wedge. Generate traction, start winning, getting early wins on the board with customers. We're now embedded in the CFO suite. From there, we can build the software, the products, the high utilization uh, 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 software solution and sell into that captive customer base, that CFO suite that's going to be actually utilizing the product on a daily basis. And so banking was always uh, was always the next step. We started building banking in December of 2021 is when I spun up the partnership with Stripe. Uh, we wrote our first line of code in, in Jan of 22. Uh, and then we didn't launch that product to the mass market until Q3 of 22, three quarters before the regional bank crisis experienced in uh, in uh, in the beginning of this year. Yeah. Um, 
an another interesting move that you kind of made, which I don't think everyone would have, is you'd raised capital and then even though you didn't need to, like from a capital perspective, you decided to apply and then go through YC. Um, <laughs> and I know we talked about this at the time and, and, and just curious, like, I mean, it's obviously unlocked an interesting go to market from you for, to, to be able to serve these YC founders, but just curious, what was your thought process and like, what has that, what was that experience at the time and, and kind of what have, what has been the aftermath of that experience? Yeah. Y Combinator is, is highly analogous to uh to stanford gsb where we met leor uh it's a huge investment uh but even greater return if if uh if you're very uh if you're very disciplined and and intentional about how you approach uh the the community and the network for us yeah we had raised 11 million dollars of of equity capital before going into y combinator and uh and we had to do some real soul searching around whether this was the right, uh, the right decision for the business, whether we would generate a positive return on on that equity uh, capital, on that on that dilution. And uh, for us, there was a couple of factors at play that I think are broadly applicable to the listeners on this pod. And that is, as a first time founder, and or as a B two B startup that's selling into. Uh, the startup ecosystem. If either of those are true, there's a there's a good chance that the dilution is worth it. On number one, uh, while I got some of this during the the two year program at, at the GSB, like I said, I hadn't focused on the entrepreneurship classes. There's no better place uh, in my <clears throat> in my mind uh, than Y Combinator to get the zero to one, the one to ten playbook. The GPs uh, at YC are truly second to none. Their door is always open, and they're always in your corner. It's not always true for the the you know all, all institutional equity investors where where sometimes uh, there's there's a misalignment of of interests and, and motivation. Uh, that's that's never the case with YC. They're always they always have your back and they're always they're always uh, available uh, to help uh, with pretty much any question going from zero to one. And then they've seen it all from every stage from pre seed through IPO. And so <clears throat> that resource that 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 network is invaluable, uh, particularly for a first time founder. And then bucket two, uh, this was the reason that that you know we do everything bottoms up. So we modeled out the percentage uh, share capture we would need across the full uh, YC alumni base in order to be accretive to the equity on that on that seven points that they take at the <clears throat> on the on the right, what is it now five hundred k of investment. We did that that model. We 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 did the sensitivity analysis, and I knew exactly how many logos I needed to win during that three month time period in order to make the the payback. Uh, and we did, and, and and then some. And now to present day, you know, YC is is our top uh, distribution channel. We're we're deeply ingrained in the YC community. We're winning thirty to fifty percent of of every batch on the banking relationship, and and uh, and we're giving back in a really big way to the community uh, because they've done a lot for us. Love the sensitivity analysis. Glad to see that your <laughs> your finance roots are still. <laughs> Every, everything, everything I do is is sensitized for the most part. So uh, every new product or feature we launch, there's a, a typically a, a, every commission model. Obviously, I build it all myself, and I and I sensitize probably you yeah. know, to to a, to a uh, maybe too much sometimes, but um, to a fault. Uh, but I like to know what it takes uh, to have a successful launch, whether it's joining YC and incurring seven percent dilution. Uh, or whether it's launching uh, a new feature in the in the banking app, what what I expect the behavior will be, how many deposits will drive to which account, and what the net revenue impact is to the company, um, those are all things we do bottoms up. Um, that goes with marketing capex, every new hire you make at the business, and of course our revenue forecasting. Yeah, I barely remember how to use Excel from my from my banking days, but I'm just more impressed if anything. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm curious on the second point about YC. That is something that I've personally heard over and over again. I'm curious in practice, how does YC promote such strong like interbatch uh, like connections? And I'm sure they don't like force every YC company to be a customer of yours, for example. But clearly, given they're still your biggest distribution channel, like there's something about the ecosystem that sets it up for success. Like, what do you think they do well um, or do at all to make that possible for their companies? They do a great job fostering a sense of community 
uh, everyone goes, has this common, everyone is going through, you know, common pain points for one. And every, all the, all these founders are going zero to one. They're all suffering through piv- what they call pivot hell and in, in YC where, where you're, you're changing your idea every other week and you're looking for traction ahead of demo day. So everyone goes to this common experience. It's like going through a business school program or <clears throat> going through a, a rush or pledging process and in undergrad, if you're in Greek life or, you know, there's plenty of analogies here. Uh, with Y Combinator, you're all going through the same program. You're all at the same, for the most part, the same at the same point, very vulnerable point in the startup life cycle. And so you're experiencing, uh, and everyone that has gone through YC has experienced uh, these these common challenges. And uh, and then YC does a great job taking those common themes and forming the sense of community. They have events and networking, of course, but it's really just this this the 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 lessons that they ingrained you during the program around helping each other out and, and supporting other yc founders and the founder community more broadly uh when i get an email from a yc founder um they want to pro- run a product idea by me they want help iterating on their latest pivot <clears throat> i'm uh, i'm more likely to, to answer that call and, and help them out um it kind of alluded this to, to this dynamic a little bit earlier, but as we start to you know talk a little bit more about Arc today, I mean, one decision that you made by kind of building the company as as it is is essentially like you decided to go after like a, a large um, market with kind of to, to your earlier kind of point and what you were alluding to, like essentially asymmetric upside, um, and but one that is you know at least by some you know perceptions and whatnot uh, bloody like a bloody ocean. Um, other folks kind of choose to kind of go after, um, you know, a, a, a small blue, blue lake or, or whatever to kind of beat this metaphor to death. So just curious, like, as you thought, and are you coming you think, up with these on the spot or this, or this textbook? Uh, this is just like, you know, VC speak, just effusing out of me. <laughs> so, um, no, but like, uh, you know, there is this dynamic that you chose to engage with. And like, I think a lot of founders like think to themselves, like, do I want to enter this gigantic market where there's a lot of competitors uh, or competitors, at least on some dimension, or do I want to focus on this thing that no one gives a shit about? I think you can make the arguments for both, but just curious, like, how did you think about it? Yeah. What I was solving for, actually to, to tie it all back to your earlier point, like why did I leave finance to go into entrepreneurship? Uh, f- finance is great for high achieving individuals who want to operate within an existing framework and there's a knowable outcome. You, you, you work really hard and you can, you can pretty much model out what your lifetime earnings are and where you will be in 10 years if you follow that linear path. And that's great. And it was great for me at the time. Um, uh, when I decided to take the leap in entrepreneurship, I decided that I wanted to bet on myself uh, and my ability to outperform in a hyper competitive, uh, capitalistic environment, right? Where, where, uh, there is no ceiling, uh, to, uh, to your performance and you're calling the shots and, and identifying, uh, the growth shoots and it's up to you to capitalize on the market opportunity. Uh, but, and if you do and you're lucky and, and you work hard, um, and most importantly, you build damn good product, uh, then there's no limit to what you can accomplish. And so for me, I wanted the largest possible market. Uh, it happened to be a market that I knew intimately well, financial services, and it happened to be a market that is extraordinarily, uh, wildly underpenetrated by, by technology. Uh, you, look at, you look at commercial banking, uh, there's 20, nearly $20 trillion of commercial deposits in the United States alone. Uh, I just in the UK launching our globally, there's another four trillion of deposits there. But just looking at the US market, you're talking about an 18 trillion dollar market of commercial deposits, of which the B2B fintech brands combined comprise meaningfully less than one percent. And so uh, when I thought about the ca- the market for capital and the market for uh, bank deposits, they are infinitely large and they're underpenetrated by technology. And in my mind, based on my experience working in financial services and in my experience meeting with all of these founders and investors uh, uh, and prospective customers in the Bay Area during my second year at Stanford, uh, I saw these companies as being underserved. I realized that that this 
particular segment of the market, this, this, the innovation economy, they're being underserved by the traditional financial services uh, institutions, the traditional FIs. Uh, at the time, it was Silicon Valley Bank. I opened bank accounts at FRB and SVB. I went through multiple capital raising processes myself across every lender in the market. And I saw uh, how much friction and how operationally burdensome the capital raising process was. And then how these tech banks, they had no tech themselves, whereas they're banking all of these companies that are driving all of the innovation uh, and disruption in the global economy. But the banks they're working with are completely offline and relationship driven. And so I said, well, wait a minute, maybe I can build the next generation banking platform, the next generation business banking platform purpose built for this segment of the market, uh, where the lion's share of the market is currently participating or banking with and raising capital from traditional offline publicly traded FIs uh, who lack technology. And so that was the oper the real long-term opportunity that I, I honed in on over the following uh, two and a half years and what we're building towards today. On that note, maybe talk a little bit about like against the, the commercial banking alternatives or, or, or whoever, like talk a little bit about like the, the kind of architecture of ARC, so to speak that enables y'all to actually be a little bit more nimble and kind of engage in technology in ways that some of these other folks cannot. I like the pun, Lior, uh, the ar architect. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, That's so, so first of all, maybe, maybe it's helpful to start with, you know, what, what is ARC? Uh, sure. I've alluded to it, but I haven't hit it head on. ARC is like a bank uh, in that we offer the two core product pillars of a commercial bank, which is uh, debt capital uh, and uh, and depository accounts, right? So bank accounts, uh, but mm -hmm. we're not a bank and we don't structurally offer mm -hmm. or sell the actual bank account, uh, or the debt product, right? What we've built is the front end, uh, software and the infrastructure layer that makes it easier for modern technology companies to access the best financial products in the market to tap into, uh, the highest yielding and the safest uh, banking products in the market to safeguard their cash, manage their everyday finances, optimize yield, maximize FDIC coverage. You can do all of that through ARC's network of banks, which we provide access through through our infrastructure and front end layer. On the capital side, it's the same story. All of these lenders, while they're offline, they're manual, and you go through these arduous, disjointed processes to raise debt, uh, to run a debt capital markets process, across 20 different funds and bank and non-bank lenders. With ARC in one user interface, uh, we can make the whole market for you. In one process, we can run 20 processes simultaneously and get you the best terms in the market and structure those terms and rip out months of time that you would otherwise spend negotiating term sheets across a disjointed debt capital raise internally uh, and also result in hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost savings on that credit facility for our customers. Very cool. So there's like some element of like, you kind of start with revenue-based financing, you kind of, you know, you start to you know, perform like all sorts of various like lending and capital products. And you can imagine an end state when you know, essentially, or maybe this is already happening now, like where, where companies are essentially on arc and all of this can be done kind of automatically um, in, in, in essentially using their inherent data in order to underwrite them more properly, like automatically. That's exactly right. And so I don't know when we're airing this, uh, this pod, but what we're announcing on, on, uh, in the first week of January, uh, is our new product. It's called ARC Capital Markets. Uh, and what it, uh, what we are announcing is the full transition from being a direct lender, which was the revenue based financing business that we started with three years ago, uh, to a fully asset light off balance sheet capital, uh, market strategy where, we have made the venture debt market. We've built the first venture debt marketplace for Silicon Valley. We've aggregated all of the best technology focused lenders, both bank and non-bank. We've mapped out their credit box. We've built a fully automated underwriting, you know, data-driven underwriting uh, ingestion and monitoring experience for both the lenders and the customers that are applying for debt. And we can eliminate months of friction uh, from the from the experience of raising debt capital for these customers. And so that comes equipped with financial API integrations for real-time onboarding. So we can just simply ingest your raw financial data rather than trading dozens of emails with 
with bankers. We have a virtual data room, which leverages AI and ML to actually synthesize all this data, package it up and share with the lenders in a standardized and consistent format. Uh, and then similarly, we have a real-time data access so we can help the lenders monitor their portfolio companies on an ongoing basis. Um, these, these processes uh, are currently completely offline and manual for both the lenders and the customers who are trying to access capital. It results in a ton of overhead and op operational intensity for these under-resourced, high-growth tech companies that just want to be focused on building their product and delighting their customers, uh, not on, on optimizing debt terms or, quite frankly, uh, bank terms with a bunch of offline uh, uh, lenders and, and commercial banks uh, who don't have a software product of their own. Mm, very cool. Um, you know, what, what, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, this is probably a really naive question, but as someone who has never raised debt before, I'm curious about, um, like I've noticed anecdotally, it's become more prevalent. Like when people announce rounds, a lot of them will announce, you know, debt rounds as well. Are there specific types of startups or stages or some kind of kind of unifying uh, common feature that startups that do choose to raise debt or have, or, or I guess in your mind, like why should certain startups raise debt? Um, or like what makes a startup good to, to raise debt? Um, which by the way, congratulations on the announcement. It sounds um, exciting um, as someone who has to deal with a lot of paperwork as part of <laughs> my company. I'm like, the last thing I'd want to do is do more. So I'm compelled, but curious about, yeah, who you're seeing you're serving the most and the best right now. Yeah, there's really, there's really two type, two profiles of startup in terms of qualification for uh, debt capital. Uh, there's those who have, are highly liquid uh, and may or may not have the fundamentals to support a, a traditional uh, debt uh, uh, a debt facility, uh, but they call that venture debt, right? You raise tons of cash, and uh, and you're effectively collateralizing that cash to extend runway. And in the traditional model, which SVB owned, you know, seventy percent of that market not too long ago, uh, you go you would go to a bank, traditionally SVB, and you'd raise twenty percent of your equity round on top of you know, if you raise a $10 million round, you get $2 million of, of debt alongside that. And, and what the banks were underwriting was the GP who came into, uh, really the GP who led you around and their propensity to follow on or uh, to backstop uh, the, the debt if things go sideways in the downside scenario. That's how traditional venture debt worked. Now, everything really changed in Q1 of this year. Uh, the unspoken story of the regional bank crisis of Q1 of 23 was the dislocation of the venture debt market. Yes, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of customers' deposits were frozen, rightfully so. That was the headline media narrative. And yes, ARC was there onboarding all of these companies and helping them safeguard their cash, their banking product. But the unspoken story that we're still feeling today uh, is the fragmentation of the venture debt landscape. Now you have uh, credit funds and uh, banks who are moving into this space uh, for the first time. So the bank and non-bank lenders who are moving into the space and picking up share from what, what was once a market dominated by one or two players. Uh, and CFOs and founders, they don't know where to go for the best debt or the best terms or whether or not they're qualified for it. And that's the gap that we're ultimately solving. And so you have the traditional model where you're collateralizing cash, but then even more interestingly, it's all of the companies who might've raised in 21 or 22, they have great fundamentals, but they need to catch up to valuation and need some additional runway to get there. The venture debt, the traditional venture debt banks, they don't do those facilities. It's these non-bank lenders and some of the new entrants in the regional banking side. They have the risk appetite and the knowledge and credit underwriting capabilities to serve this segment of the market. And we're helping provide distribution to high quality, you know, premium growth stage companies, providing distribution to lenders or providing access to those customers, helping structure the best possible deal to extend runway, weather the storm and ultimately catch up with their valuation. Uh, so that they can continue to to grow their business and motivate their teams. You know, you mentioned SVB. Uh, just curious, like, I mean, talk talk to us a little bit about the chaos of of those days, uh, <laughs> building products, like servicing new customers. Like, how did that all go down? Yeah, I mean, Lior, craziest, uh, most intense three to five days of my life. Certainly my professional career, but arguably my, my entire life. Uh, from the, the night that the 8K was released, uh, where mm -hmm. SVB first disclosed this really meaningful asset liability mismatch to the, mm -hmm. the stock coming down in the afters 
And then of course, when the markets open the next morning, you know, since that 8K uh, uh, was published to uh, several weeks after, I mean, we were just working around the clock. Uh, the, the, that week in itself, uh, weekly average inflows were up 15 X versus historical averages. If you weren't shipping code, uh, you were on the customer success team onboarding, uh, new companies, helping them, uh, safeguard their cash from this impending, uh, crisis that was unfolding around us. Uh, I had a deluge of text messages and phone calls and WhatsApp messages from hundreds of, of founders and CFOs and investors, uh, asking me, pleading with me if I could help them move their company's cash uh, out of out of the regional banking system and onto you know an FDIC eligible account, and we did. And the team worked around the clock. It was it was a rise uh, to the occasion moment for the full team, myself included. The morning after the 8K, I called an emergency all hand first thing in the morning, full team on, and it was it was war it was uh, war mode, right? Yeah. So. Engineers need to pull forward X, Y, and Z features. Those features were 5 million of FDIC coverage, a product which we weren't planning to launch for months. It was scoped. We had built the partnership. We needed to pull forward months of product development to spin up 5 million of FDIC coverage, basically overnight. Uh, we made changes to our onboarding experience to make it even more frictionless, instant approvals of accounts. Um, and then everyone else, right? If, if you weren't working on these, these mission critical features, uh, you were onboarding customers and helping put founders and CFOs minds at ease that their cash was safe and that they didn't have to worry about making payroll. By that weekend, uh, by that weekend, there were uh, when SVB had, by Friday, when SVB had blocked all outbound wires and there were still you know, 100 billion plus of startup deposits at the bank. Uh, that's when things got really interesting. It was uncertain whether the uh, whether uh, the treasurer, the U.S. government would step in to backstop SVB. It was a very political moment, if you recall. And uh, we started funding payroll advances. I spun up this payroll financing business using that direct lending business I shared earlier overnight. And all day Saturday, me and my chief credit officer, uh, we were approving payroll financing deals. I was raising hundreds of millions of dollars of capital and creating this market over the weekend with with lenders who wanted to provide this financing. And we were instantly depositing millions of dollars of cash to our customers' accounts who had all of their cash tied up with SVB and didn't know if they would make payroll on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday the next week. Mm. Um, by middle of the day, Sunday, uh, everything was, you know, the government saved the day uh, and the market evaporated overnight. Uh, I've never been happier to waste so much hard work uh, than, than I did over the weekend because, uh, because Silicon Valley was was saved and everything you know returned to, to normal after that um, for for uh, for most of the market, with the exception of startup banking, uh, which you know we've grown another four or five x since that time. I, I was gonna, actually related to that point. I'm curious if you found any long lasting consumer behavior changes or I guess customer behavior changes. Um, like obviously everyone remembers <laughs> that event. Um, but something that I was commenting on with Lior is that uh, I feel like in some ways some it feels like things are are back to normal. You mentioned the venture debt implications and how people seek that out. Is there anything else that you guys have seen lasting beyond just kind of the immediate weekend? Absolutely. And so prior to the regional bank crisis, uh, tech companies, they didn't really uh, they didn't do any diligence around who the underlying bank partner was, what the safe, what how how safe uh, the their bank was. Uh, everyone worked at the same one or two banks, and seventy percent of of venture back tech companies had one bank account. Uh, fast forward uh, to to March uh, to April of so following the regional bank crisis, April of this year. Now, on average, companies have three to, you know three to five bank accounts. So a lot more fragmentation across a tech company's bank stack. And then there's been a migration from the regional banks, uh, including the fintechs, uh, the regional banks to uh, the world's largest banks, the world's safest balance sheets, like of likes of JP Morgan Chase. And so uh, fragmentation of the bank stack uh, and and a migration from regional banks to uh, to two big two big to fail banks, US GSIBs, uh, like the likes of JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. At ARC, uh, we had the benefit of being 
uh, the the up and coming challenger who, who pulled forward a whole bunch of product development post uh, bank crisis. And so Arc is positioned today as the only B2B fintech brand built on the world's largest banks. And so we've been uh, where we, we where we are uniquely positioned and differentiated in the market is uh, it's winning these up market customers. It's winning the companies that have ten to hundred million dollars of cash on balance sheet, uh, but and, and will only bank with a US GSIB, but who certainly miss that customized startup focused experience of the regional bank. And of course, the UI UX that comes with a, a fintech platform arcs it to the intersection of all three built on the world's largest balance sheets with leading edge user experience and a customized you know, vertical, uh, a vertical product focus on uh, the hyper growth cash burning venture back tech company. Um, you know, as we start to talk about kind of arc in the future, you know, you've built the team up from, you know, a, a couple individuals, you and Nick, you know, calling around folks and, and now you're at 50, 50 people, half engineers, like what have you learned about team building and what have you learned about, you know, managing folks now that you're kind of in like that kind of mid sized startup <laughs> phase at least. Yeah. Yeah. Team is everything. Uh, they say it, you know, it, it, I see, they say it at Stanford business school, uh, your, your, your seed stage investors tell you, you know, it's the case, uh, it's reality Te team is everything who you surround yourself with, uh, early on, right. And the, the, your first 10 hires, you're certainly your first 20. It really matters not only in terms of, uh, product velocity and, uh, and customer success, uh, but, but more, you know, more, more importantly, having the right individuals who have the right attitude, right? The, the zero to one mindset, the entrepreneurial spirit, the hustle and the grit it takes to, to survive multiple pivots or repositionings and never give up, right? That DNA is so rare. Um, not, not as rare in startups uh, because you self-select into that, you know, you look for those people, uh, but finding those those startup operators, it's a very rare breed. And if you find the right people, uh, hold on to them uh, because they are the secrets to uh, your company's success. Uh, individuals who are not afraid to try new things, to work really hard uh, and to have the grit uh, to face a lot of rejection and just never give up and keep pushing forward. Finding that, identifying that DNA, that quality and hiring for it, being very explicit in hiring for it. and then codifying it at scale into your culture, your corporate DNA, through your corporate values and reinforcing those on a regular basis. Um, I think that's been been one of the, the key learnings around team uh, and hiring uh, going from zero to one and then you know one to, to 10. I imagine 10 to a thousand is going to be a whole new set of uh, set of skills. Are there any kind of like non-obvious insights you've gained from, you know, actually building a team with those qualities? Because everyone wants to have those things and feels like a lot of folks end up hiring where a couple of people are like that, but it's not necessarily pervasive throughout the organization. So curious what you've learned and actually like, like starting to get there um, versus maybe, you know, some folks who've, who've kind of failed in, in that search, in that quest. Yeah. I've, I've, I've experimented kind of like finding product market fit and, and refining the platform vision early on. I've similarly experimented with a whole type of uh, management and you know, operational uh, frameworks to run the business efficiently uh, and, and ensure, well, ensuring that we're hiring the best talent and motivating people. I think there's been a couple of key learnings. Uh, one is... Uh, motivating your team, recognizing success and outperformance, defining what that means and, and then and then showcasing uh, those attributes to the team saying, this is good, <laughs> emulate this person. They do this really well. They have this you know entrepreneurial spirit. They have this ownership mentality. Here's specifically what they what they've done. Um, and this is why they're aligned with the corporate mission and values, making that very public and recognizing that, that, that outperformance across the full team that allows others in the team to see what it takes um, to succeed in the organization. Uh, 
empowering those people, right? Giving them autonomy. Uh, so the, the saying, you know, hire, hire smart people and get out of the way. It's very true in the zero to one environment. Uh, the leadership team is very thin. We intentionally hire in the early stage, especially. So, the, you know, the first 30 employees hire people who, who operate uh, with autonomy and can break down, you know, break through walls to solve a problem without handholding uh, because the managerial layer is so thin and you don't have the time to, to micromanage employees early on. It's important to hire people with that, with that DNA. Um, some of the, the structural uh, elements that I brought into the organization or it, it took a lot of iteration, obviously aligning incentives with compensation. So uh, having variable comp for the business team, I found to, to, to structurally uh, incentivize the right behavior, not because you don't trust people, but more that you can change, you can constantly tweak certain variables uh, to, 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 to ensure that everyone's moving in the right direction. Maybe one day in a zero rate environment, you want to be incentivizing the, the sale of loans, but maybe in a five and a half percent environment, you want to be commissioning uh, on, on uh, bank logo acquisition and, and on, on bank deposit volumes. And so uh, variable comp is a big one and, and make not being afraid to make changes to that variable comp structure if you know it's not working. And then being radically transparent with the team around whether or not they're on track to hit plan, whether they believe the, the structure is unreasonable, and if you need to make revisions to make it more achievable to ensure you're motivating your team. And then tying that together with, uh, we now do quarterly OKRs. And so uh, we have uh, OKRs by function with DRIs across, with, with directly responsible individuals across each KR. Uh, and then we review those not only on a quarterly basis, but on a weekly basis. So I kick off every Monday, bright and early with an all hands meeting. I call it the Monday morning huddle. And at that Monday morning huddle, uh, I produce a report called the Monday morning metrics. Those are the top North star KPIs that ultimately roll up to the, the quarterly plan and to the annual plan. And so at all times, the team is aligned on what are the top priorities of the organization and what progress have we made week over week on tracking towards those. And if we're behind schedule, why is that the case? And what can we do to correct that behavior before it's too late? You know, I'm curious, have you, oh, we were ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to get like your, your kind of meticulous nature. And like, it just, it kind of shows and all these kind of anecdotes and examples. And like, if you're going to build a business in spaces where it it, it is going to be operationally difficult, and then eventually you're going to have to add technology on top of that. But it's still, um, you know, still necessary to push folks in the right direction the way that you have it's just like you have to have this level of you know uh, you have to be maniacal to some extent i'm not not trying to put a you know a, a, a title over you but i think being so meticulous is is a superpower and i think it's it's interesting kind of how you how you framed incentives and how you framed um you know managing the team as well and then of course needless to say but at the early stages equitizing your early team members uh is Critical. Uh, I know not everyone does it. Uh, most venture back companies in my network do. And I encourage every early stage founder to ensure that every employee at the company, no matter their role, has an equity stake in the business and thinks like an owner. The number one value at ARC is literally ownership mentality. Think like an owner. That is the number one value at ARC uh, that we socialize with the team on a regular basis and we reinforce the full team. They also happen to be equity owners in the business and assuming that we're hitting our, our OKRs and we're collaborating and, and we're breaking down walls and going the extra mile, uh, everyone benefits. And uh, it's not just to create a large equity outcome for yourself, uh, but really to, to build something special and, and create a big business and know that you took part in building that, that business, right? This environment's not for everyone. Working in a startup is not, uh, is not for most of my friends uh, who, who work in, in finance to this day. Uh, but if you're the right kind of crazy, uh, like the three of us are, uh, and you want to be part of that, uh, that environment, um, there's nothing better in the world. And those are the people you want to attract and motivate and incentivize um, and, and promote in the organization. Yeah, I think that's a very underrated thing about tech in general. Just like the fact that equity isn't more uh, used across other industries and isn't standard across most jobs, I think is mind blowing to me because I agree it just causes so much kind of team alignment, loyalty, motivation. It just it makes so much sense. 
Def- I mean, collaboration cross-functionally is everything, right? You, you need your engineers. Uh, you need your engineers to understand the pain points of your sales reps and vice versa. Uh, ultimately, uh, if, if product and engine design doesn't feel, does, doesn't feel the pain of, of you know, uh, a, lot, a missed opportunity on sales and vice versa, you're not going to be able to build uh, the flywheel that's required to scale uh, 10x year over year, right? To, to grow, to grow really fast with limited resources, and so you need everyone on the same page at all times, uh, and having making everyone in the company an owner helps, and reinforcing the message that you are all owners in this business, and we're building this together. Uh, that's really important, especially especially in the early days. Um, before we get into rapid fire, you know, um, in the next like call it five or ten years, like what's where is Arc? What's kind of the headline, so to speak? Like, what what do you envision for for this next stage of the company? Sure, uh, five to ten years, Arc will be a global, multi billion dollar, publicly traded bank banking platform for the innovation economy. We'll partner with the world's leading banks and the world leading lenders. Uh, we'll make it frictionless for technology companies to run financial transactions, to raise debt and equity capital, to manage their full banking stack and all of their finances. At the click of a button, self-serve, but with the support of dedicated relationship managers. And so ARC will become the next global banking brand for the innovation economy um, in partnership with traditional banks, in partnership with the world's leading offline financial institutions who do what they do best. Uh, which is grow a big balance sheet uh, and manage risk and regulators. That's awesome. Should we go to rapid fire? We were... <laughs> All right. I don't know what to expect in this one, guys. Yeah. Well, Don, that's perfect because you just have to answer whatever comes top of mind first. And like, I'll do my best. Or less, do my usually. Best. Nothing too crazy in here. Um, well, the first is the founder that you look up to most. Jeff Bezos. Hmm. Um, a book that most changed your life. I'm currently reading Walter Isaacs and Elon Musk. Uh, it is inspiring. Mm. To least. What's like one nugget that you've liked from that book so far? I haven't read it yet. Grit and resilience, just the unwillingness to give up. They talk about when Elon blew up his second or third rocket and gets in front of his team. Everyone is devastated. They were they they put everything on red and then the 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 rocket blows up and Elon shakes it off and says, "Let's get it right next time." And the team left inspired and motivated and and it was I mean the way Walter Walter is a brilliant writer but it's like a switch was flipped. Um, that's what it ta- that's mm. what it takes. I mean, <laughs> the number of times wow. we've experienced that at Arc, right? Um, on a much smaller scale, uh, it's inspiring. That's Politics. so funny, contrasting. Right. What do you think about Elon Musk? Uh, the book is very good. Highly recommend. Yeah. Contrasting that with his like uh, deal book stage, yeah. Bob Iger, GFY thing. That's hilarious. Um, interesting. Um, the job that you'd want if you couldn't be a founder. Interesting. Uh, I would... Private equity associate? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I don't know about associate. My my aspiration long term was to be an investor, was to start my own hedge fund. Actually, I wanted to participate mm. in the public markets. Very right, cool. Um, your favorite account, and this can be anything like a Twitter account, newsletter, Instagram meme account. Uh, Shamath, and more broadly, the All In podcast. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, what was your first job? You mentioned something in like food before. I was a, I was a fry cook. Uh, I, I actually, I got promoted to being a fry cook after, after washing dishes and mopping floors, uh, for a few months, but I made, nice. I made it to the fry later. I can make a, a great fish and chips if you guys are ever interested. Love that. <laughs> I am. Great talent. Um, and the last one, this is like a mega trend that you're most excited about. It could be related to arc in your industry or just a consumer trend about the world more broadly that you're excited about. Yeah, very self-serving, but I live and breathe it every day. Uh, it's the digitalization of financial services. It's the secular market trend away from offline business banking to uh, to online uh, to online banking. 
leveraging technology for uh, more frictionless access to capital and banking products. Well, Don, thank you so much. This is so fun. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was a great time. Great to see you guys.